You're listening to the Sermon Podcast for the Peak Church, located in Apex, North Carolina. Our church is striving to welcome all who are feeling disconnected from God. And so our hope is that over the next several minutes, you will connect with the God that we are talking about, and you'll resonate deeply with the life that this God wants for you. We hope you enjoy. The scripture passage for today is from the book of 2 Timothy Chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Understand that the last days will be dangerous times. People will be selfish and love money. They will be the kind of people who brag and who are proud. They will slander others and they will be disobedient to their parents. They will be ungrateful, unholy, unloving, contrary, and critical. They will be without self-control and brutal and they won't love what is good. They will be people who are disloyal, reckless, and conceited. They will love pleasure instead of loving God. They will look like they are religious, but deny God's power. Avoid people like this. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. did an experiment where they offered children a choice. They could eat one marshmallow immediately, or they could wait 10 minutes and eat two marshmallows. Many of you are probably familiar with this. I'm already seeing heads nodding because this kind of experiment has been done and redone so many times with Oreos or cupcake. I'm going to leave this here if you don't eat it while I'm gone, right? Some of you might have even tried this on your own children just to see what they would do. But do you know what the results of that study showed? The researchers at Stanford actually followed these children throughout their lives as they grew up into adulthood, and they found that the children who chose to wait for that better reward, to delay gratification and get a double dessert, that on the whole, they had better academic performance, better test scores, and lower rates of substance abuse and incarceration as compared to the children who chose to eat the one marshmallow right away. And that study has been replicated many times by other research groups since then with very similar results, except for one thing. The ratio between people that choose the one versus two marshmallows. Our ability to delay gratification has only gotten worse in the years since Stanford first did that experiment. And a lot of that is due to the rise of technology in our lives. We live in the age of instant gratification because we have everything at our fingertips. We spend hours a day scrolling on social media where we share content and get this immediate feedback of likes, comments, and shares. We have streaming services on all our devices, so we don't even have to wait a week to watch the next episode of our favorite show. We can binge the whole season in one go. We shop online more than we shop in store these days, and I'll just tell on myself first. Just this week, I was shopping for flood bucket supplies, and not even 15 minutes into the shopping trip, I found myself thinking, man, I should have just placed a pickup order. Like, people are in crisis, and I can't even go to the store for 15 minutes without thinking, man, I wish this was faster. And let alone the not shopping in person at all, we can Amazon Prime now yesterday stuff to our front porch without having to wait for shipping time at all. I find myself frustrated ordering from other websites when I have to wait three to five business days for something to arrive. And with all this technology at our fingertips, 
We expect to have instant communication and unfettered access to each other's lives. Because of all of that, our impatience has skyrocketed and our attention spans have plummeted. And it's having really serious consequences on our lives and our well-being. It's driven people to much more impulsive spending habits. So we're seeing a lot of relationship issues, forming friendships, maintaining romantic relationships. People are having difficulty communicating and working on that relationship when things get hard because they get bored, they want to move on, they want the thing that feels good. Anxiety and depression are on the rise, and frankly, our bodies are actually suffering physically as well from all the increased screen time and living such sedentary lives. We are, and I don't say this lightly, addicted to instant gratification. We are addicted to the rush of dopamine that comes from constant stimulation and never having to wait for anything, and the more we get it, the more we need it. And with that comes our now severely reduced ability to solve problems, to think critically, to deal with frustration and pain, and to just be uncomfortable. And I don't know about you, but that scares the heck out of me. But there is good news. If you're sitting here thinking, oh God, I'm doomed to have for the rest of my life the same amount of self-control I had when I was four years old and chose the one marshmallow, that's actually not the case. That's not the case. The ability to delay gratification, to wait for a better reward, it's not just an innate skill that some people have and some people don't. It's actually, like any other skill, something you can train, something you can practice and strengthen and as followers of Jesus, it just might be the most important skill for us to practice. If you're joining us in worship for the first time, we have been over the past couple of weeks in a sermon series called Life Goals, Seven Steps, Seven Swaps, Seven Shifts to Live a More Meaningful, Purposeful, and Christ-like Life. And today, we are talking about the importance of replacing instant gratification with self-control. Our scripture passage for today came to us from 2 Timothy chapter 3. This is um, one of many letters written by Paul. This one's written to Timothy, and Paul and Timothy are besties. So most of Paul's letters go something like this. Grace to you and peace. Jesus loves you so much that he gave his life so you could have life. Y'all better get your ish together. Also, Timothy says hi. That's pretty much the outline for most of Paul's letters. And Paul, if you're new to studying scripture, he is like the OG pastor. So he was always writing to churches and communities, giving them guidance on how to live a Christ-like life. But this letter is a little bit different. This letter he's writing directly to Timothy, someone he spent a lot of time with, someone he's mentored and also, 2 Timothy is Paul's last letter. Paul is in prison once again, but this time he knows that his trial and his execution are imminent. He knows that the end is near, and so this whole letter is really Paul passing the torch to Timothy to continue his ministry, to keep the faith, to do the work and witness to Jesus Christ in the world once Paul is gone and here in chapter 3, Paul is specifically warning Timothy how hard the work of following Jesus is. How much endurance and patience and self-control it takes to go against the grain, to do the thing Christ calls you to instead of what the world wants, even if it costs you everything. Here's the truth, friends. So often in life and especially in faith, the hard thing and the faithful thing are the same thing. The hard thing and the faithful thing are almost always the same thing. And Paul knows this. And he's telling Timothy that right here, right now, if you're going to follow in my footsteps, if you're going to follow Jesus with your life, if you're going to share your testimony with other people, you need to know right now that the hard thing and the faithful thing 
are going to be the same thing. And you're going to have to have the self-control to do that hard, faithful work. Paul doesn't use the word instant gratification. He doesn't use the word dopamine addiction. But what he's describing is so similar to what we experience today. And will you throw that scripture back up for us? Paul has just created this catalog of vices. It's just about every negative character trait that you could possibly embody. Just like pick one, tag yourself as a vice. And ultimately, I think all of this actually hinges on the last few verses. If people will love pleasure instead of loving God. They will look like they're religious, but deny God's power, avoid people like this. Each of us is on our own discipleship journey, but we all have to ask ourselves the same question. Do I love pleasure? Do I love instant gratification? Do I love getting my way right away more than I love God? Am I willing to do the hard, faithful thing that God has called me to do? Or do I just look religious on the outside? Not only has Paul given Timothy and us this warning of what chasing instant gratification at the expense of true discipleship looks like, that it leads to all of these vices... He's actually modeling it for us too. Paul knows his life is on the line, and he says so in other parts of this letter to Timothy. And frankly, he knows the way out of prison too. Paul could easily renounce his faith. He could turn his back on the Lord and be freed. And he knows this firsthand because this used to be Paul's job before he became a follower of Jesus. Paul was one of the chief persecutors of Christians, putting people in jail, getting people executed for their faith. He knows that all it takes is just to renounce it, to say, oh, nope, never mind, just kidding, hmm, didn't mean that. And he's free to go. He can live his life comfortably in safety he's got a quick immediate answer to his problem and frankly he's actually already been in prison before he's had the opportunity to escape prison before but each time including this one he's chosen to make the sacrifice that Jesus asks all of us to make to be brave enough to do the faithful thing even when it is hard. Even when it asks a lot of us. Even when it demands everything. If you're new to studying scripture, passages like these can feel really intimidating. So pro-Bible study tip. <laughs> When you get to a passage like this, there's a couple of ways you might respond. Number one, you feel really overwhelmed by it. You maybe even feel scared. You start to maybe feel guilty or shameful, like, I'm a terrible person. I've done all of these things. Like, probably this week I've done all of these things. Or maybe you go the opposite side and you're like, oh, well... <laughs> I'm not that bad of a person. Paul clearly says, avoid people like this. So he's not talking to me. He's asking me to identify it in other people. And I hate to break it to you, but either one of those you choose is ultimately the easy way out. It's a choice to just disengage, to not do the hard work of letting this scripture sink in, letting this scripture change you. And I get it. I get it. Again, I'm in the business of telling on myself first. Y'all, I did this this week. When I realized this was the passage I was preaching on, my first reaction was, do I have to? This is uncomfortable. This is scary. It stirs up in us all of these negative emotions. And it's very human to want to disengage from that. But that's not the life that Jesus calls us to. One of the ways, actually, that we practice self-control, that we start training that muscle, is by resisting the temptation to take the easy way out of Scripture passages, to feel good in the moment but not get any good out of it in the long run. 
One of the ways that we practice this is by being willing to be uncomfortable, by asking honestly, vulnerably, which of these vices live in me? Which of these, maybe if I'm not doing it right now, am I prone to? Which of these do I have to take extra care to avoid, to be proactive about resisting? Even if I'm not doing it right now, what of this lives in me? And if you're feeling like, okay, I can try that, but I don't really know how to start because it's so overwhelming and there's so many of them, let me offer you a tool for reading scripture. There's a practice of reading scripture called Lectio Divina. Lectio Divina just means divine reading. And it's a way of reading scripture where you just read it over and over again and let it sort of reveal something to you through the Spirit. So for Lectio Divina, you find a short passage, five verses or so will do, and you read it through. And the first time you read it, you don't do anything with it. You don't jump to any conclusions about what it means. You just read it. And then you read it again, and you ask the Spirit to bring a one word or maybe a short phrase to your mind. Like, start to notice what is sticking out to you. And then you don't do anything with that. Then you read it again, and you start to ask a question. Okay, Holy Spirit, like, why is this sticking out to me? Why are you bringing this to my attention? And then you read it again, and you start to ask, okay, God, like, what are you trying to say to me? What do you need me to hear? And then you read it again, and you start to ask and maybe try to answer the question, what am I going to do about it? How am I going to live differently? So maybe you're reading this. Ben, go back to that first slide for me. Thank you. Maybe you're reading this and you immediately see people be selfish or love money. Maybe that's what sticks out to you. And you're thinking about last week's sermon on generosity. And that, man, that really resonated with you. And now here it is again in this passage. Like maybe that's the spirit telling you like, hey, generosity is something that you need to practice. You're tempted to this. You're tempted to this. Practice generosity intentionally. Do the opposite, right? So that we can avoid these vices, so we can live into the fruits of the Spirit. Or maybe you see those who brag and are proud, and you're thinking, man, I don't like this about myself, but yeah, my ego does get the best of me at times. You maybe are thinking, I love to receive credit. I love to be impressive. I love to be the best at everything, right? Maybe you fight with people because you always have to be right and you're like, man, proud. That's the word that's getting to me today. Okay, okay. You know that. We don't need to feel ashamed of that. We take a step forward and say, okay, what's the opposite of that? I'm going to practice humility. The Spirit is bringing humility to me today as the thing that I need to live into. That's the hard, faithful thing that Jesus is calling me to. Maybe you see ungrateful and you're thinking, okay, it's gratitude. i got to work on my gratitude. I mean, think about how often you pray. How often do you ask God for something in your prayers versus how often do you thank God for something in your prayers? Or maybe you're so rattled by all the devastation we're seeing in Western North Carolina and you're realizing, holy smokes, like I've been complaining a lot lately and I have so much to be grateful for. Maybe gratitude is your practice. I can't possibly go through all of these and I think you get the point right right we won't be here all day doing this but I think you get the point that when we see scriptures like this it's so natural to disengage it's so human to feel overwhelmed or scared when really all this is is an invitation to introspection to honesty to recommitting to grow and friends this is hard work <laughs> For some of us, the hard, faithful work is just identifying the hard, faithful work, right? It's just letting the scripture work on us. And so I'm here to tell you, you've got to have people in your life that hold you accountable. You cannot do this work alone. Just this week, if you don't think God has a sense of humor... Let me uh, assure you that uh, Jesus has given me an opportunity this very week to practice the thing I am literally preaching. 
This week, a dear friend of mine, someone I care about, someone I respect, someone I trust, called me out lovingly, but honestly, that I had been a bit selfish, ungrateful, and even critical. And that conversation was not comfortable. My first reaction was to fight back and, well, you did this, right? Like, it was not comfortable for me or for them, for what it's worth. But it was so important to be able to practice self-control, to not have the immediate feel good and, and sort of win an argument, but to keep my eye on the better reward, which is growing, which is being more Christ-like by avoiding selfishness, by avoiding ingratitude, by avoiding being critical. Friends, we all have to ask ourselves this question, especially in the age of instant gratification. Do I want to be comfortable or do I want to be Christ-like? Do I love pleasure? Do I love instant gratification? Do I love getting my way right away? Do I love feeling good more than I love God? I think this is what Jesus is talking about when he talks about the narrow path that leads to life and the wide path that leads to destruction. So often people pull that passage out and they say, oh, it's about heaven and hell and there's just a few people going to heaven and a whole bunch of people going to hell. And that is just an absurd oversimplification of that passage. I think what Jesus is really trying to say is the path that leads to life is narrow because so few people are willing to do the hard, faithful work that it requires to walk that path. This path that leads to destruction is wide because it's easy. It's comfortable. That path is paved. It has no incline. You don't even need to bring water to go down that path. Everybody's just strolling. The path that leads to life, man, it's gnarled. It's got roots sticking up, and you're going to trip over them if you're not careful. There's some thorny bushes to avoid, and it is narrow because so few people are willing to be uncomfortable, are willing to practice the self-control to walk towards the better reward because it's hard. It's faithful, but it's hard. Our ability to practice self-control, to delay gratification, to wait, to work for the better reward, not the one that's right in front of us, not the one that's going to make us feel good immediately, but the one that's going to do good in the long run, friends, our ability to do that is foundational to the entire life of faith. We will not have the stamina, the discipline, the self-control to stick with any spiritual discipline if we haven't first practiced being uncomfortable, doing the hard, faithful thing. Friends, we have to constantly be in this process of introspection, of being honest, of being real about the ways that we would rather be comfortable than Christ-like. And we got to interrogate that, not to feel bad about it, not to feel shame, not to say, man, I really failed, I've fallen short, but to say, okay, yeah, I have fallen short, all fall short of the glory of God, and this is what supports I'm going to put in place so I can try again and do better next time. This is what support I'm going to put in place to embrace the grace that Jesus gives me to try again and try again and try again. I'm going to make mistakes, but I am going to commit to the hard and faithful work. Friends, I don't know what the path is for you that leads to life. I don't know what specific practices Jesus is calling you to take on. But I do know that for so many of us, the moment we encounter hardship, we take it as a sign to turn around go the other direction I must be going the wrong way because it's hard and what I've learned in the life of faith and following Jesus is it is almost always the opposite hardship is the green light you're on the right path it's not going to feel good all the time 
It's not going to feel bad all the time either, but it requires something of you. And Paul knows this firsthand. He knows what the wide path looks like. He walked it for many years. But he has chosen the narrow path, the one that leads to Jesus, to the better reward, because he knows there's just no cheap substitute. It's going to fall apart eventually. Friends, you actually can't do Christianity halfway. And even if you leave here today feeling on fire, you're like, yes, I'm going to get my life right. I'm going to try all these new things. You're not going to see results by next week. I'm sorry to be the one to have to say that to you. But this is the work of a lifetime. This is the work of a lifetime of introspection, of honesty, of accountability with other people, of reading scripture in a way that you let it sink in, you let it challenge you, you let it make you uncomfortable, you let it change you, that you're willing to feel those growing pains because you know that the growth is the better reward. Friends, may we be brave. May we be bold and courageous, not because we're not afraid, but in spite of it. Thank you for listening to The Peak Podcast. Make sure you subscribe wherever podcasts can be found. For more information on how to get connected with our church, please visit us at thepeakchurch.org.